from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our audience worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start today with the markets. They are falling again today as investors wait for that stimulus plan that President Trump has promised to try to help combat the coronavirus. Joining us for a report on the markets is Abigail Doolittle. So we had a little rally yesterday. It's not there today. Yeah, volatility is the name of the game at this point. And it happens when you have huge amounts of uncertainty out there. Over the last 15 days, though, the S&P 500 down almost 18 percent. So even though there have been rebound rallies within there, the bears overall taking over because of the uncertainty around this coronavirus. And again, as we've been talking about, what could the impact be on the global economy? And more importantly, what will the impact be on the bottom line for U.S. economies? Until we know the true scope of the issue here in the U.S., it's very difficult for investors and traders to value stocks. Some of the commentary I've seen today has said it really is disappointment because we don't have a stimulus plan. Is that fair or is it really the uncertainty about the virus itself? I think it's more uncertainty of the virus itself and, again, what the impact, the true impact could be when all is said and done on the bottom line for U.S. companies. In terms of the stimulus package, that's certainly psychological. So the fact that President Trump did not show up yesterday and offer this plan that he said he would, disappointing to the markets because anything would help. But as we were talking about yesterday, unless you know exactly what you're fighting, uh, it's hard to know if the stimulus will help. If right now, I think the last I saw, we have uh, a little more than a thousand cases here in the U.S. If that's the case, the stimulus would be very different than if, say, it balloons to a much higher number. So until we have a better sense of the scope of this tragedy here in the U.S., and again, the impact, it's hard to know uh, how much stimulus is actually needed. So that's here in the United States. We had the Bank of England and uh, also the U.K. Chancellor actually come out with a coordinated plan over in England. We hear from Christian Lagarde, who will have a decision on Thursday, that they are going to have a plan. Do the markets indicate they like that better than what's going on in the United States because we don't have a plan? To some degree earlier, because you did have you, our European stocks actually slightly higher. So the fact that you do have this seemingly coordinated effort from the UK, Europe, also Italy offering stimulus now that they're under lockdown, uh, which really points to markets investors uh, that these uh, officials see that there needs to be some sort of underreaching, overreaching, I should say, uh, support to fight off the possible economic impact, again, of this coronavirus tragedy. Okay, Abigail, thank you so much. That's Abigail Doolittle reporting on the markets. For more now on those markets and the virus, we turn to Larry Summers, a Bloomberg contributor and former U.S. Treasury Secretary. He joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, in today's Wall Street Week update. So, Larry, welcome back. It's great to have you here. We saw from the Bank of England and also the U.K. Chancellor today a response. We heard from Madame Lagarde that this was perhaps as bad as 2008. Something needs to be done in a coordinated fashion. You've had your own fair share of experience with these sorts of crises. How do you rate this one? How bad is this right now from your point of view? I think this is one of the four major events of the 21st century so far. 9-11, Katrina, and the great financial crisis. And it wouldn't amaze me if this proved to be the most serious of any of those uh, events. So I am gravely uh, concerned. I don't think the full extent of this problem has yet been uh, fully appreciated. I applaud what Mark Carney did, and I applaud the instincts behind uh, Christine Lagarde. But ultimately, this is about people being sick and not being able to work. This is about people being quarantined. This is about uncertainty as to whether life's going to go ahead as uh, normal. Harvard University, for example, closed all its classes yesterday until September. With that kind of uncertainty, we would be making a mistake if we supposed that cutting interest rates by 25 or 50 basis points was somehow going to be uh, decisive. So I'm for it. But what's really going to be important is whether we have a credible and convincing uh, problem program to contain what has happened uh, in terms of the disease, whether we have really substantial public action to stimulate uh, economies. As long as we're worrying about budgetary targets and worrying about budget deficits uh, and the like, 
I don't think we're going to get where we need to be. So, Larry, you have said we need to do something, and we need to do something big, more than monetary policy, a fair amount of fiscal. Actually, you've said as much as uh, half a trillion dollars at that sort of rate we need to be prepared to do. What about the timing? Because there does seem to be a, seem to be a delay. We were told by the president we'd had the outlines of a plan yesterday. It didn't happen. We saw the vice president. We haven't heard anything. How much time do we have? Do you have any sense? Is this a matter of days, weeks? How fast do we have to get something in place? There's much more risk of being too slow than there is of uh, being too fast. Uh, I hope we'll act as uh, rapidly po as possible on all the relevant dimensions, whether it's supporting small businesses, putting money in uh, people's uh, hands, providing uh, support for uh, most critically affected uh, industries, supporting uh, the global community, maintaining uh, the flow of uh, international trade. You know, another way I like to think about it is we're at a moment like where we were after Bear Stearns. That wasn't yet where we were after uh, Lehman, but it was a pretty critical moment. And in retrospect, the time was largely wasted. And it would have been better if we had acted much more promptly. Uh, I don't think there is uh, time uh, to lose. But most important, make no mistake, is the virus itself. That the United States doesn't have tests for everyone who needs one is really a critical problem. Yeah, obviously, the virus is the most important thing. Also, lives are at stake. I mean, not just the economy, not just the markets, but lives are at stake, which clearly is the priority. At the same time, beyond the and virus so far, itself, David. Yes. So far, David, we're talking about dozens of lives. Ultimately, we're going to be talking about thousands of lives. And I think most likely we'll be talking about hundreds of thousands of uh, lives. I would expect that nine months from now, most of the people who are watching your show will know dozens of people who have had the virus and will know people themselves who died of the virus. And I don't think people are psychologically prepared for that. I don't think our medical care system is logistically uh, prepared uh, for that. So we need to get into a mode of uh, crisis uh, preparation. Uh, so far, this is looking distressingly like uh, the administration response to Katrina. Which was too little and too late, without a doubt. Uh, and at the same time, this could have really long-term effects, without a doubt. It is having effects, and this is not the most important thing, but it has effect as well in politics. If you saw the exit polls from the Michigan primary last night that the former Vice President Joe Biden won, people put right at the top of the list how he could deal with a crisis, whether they could, it really gave him credibility in dealing with a crisis, and whether he could actually supplant President Trump. You know Vice President Biden a fair amount. Can you tell us anything about how he would be approaching this? I, I think this is, in many ways, the kind of moment his career has built towards. He was part of every critical moment in uh, the Obama administration. He watched. Uh, seven or eight presidencies deal with the whole succession of crises from the perspective of the Senate and for many, many years, the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee. He knows the apparatus of state and local governments uh, around the country from all of his experience and from having been the person who spearheaded the Obama uh, stimulus uh, plan. And one thing about uh, Joe Biden is he cares about people where they live. And when it's profoundly important, he cares about doing the right thing. There won't be uh, political hacks in positions of control over the delivery of medicines and delivery of key logistics uh, in a Biden administration. There won't be a reluctance uh, to act while people have political arguments. And there won't be a partisan football made out of this. He'll be willing to talk to everybody on the American political spectrum, from Bernie Sanders on one hand 
uh, to Ted Cruz on the other in order to get things done. Because he'll understand that this virus doesn't belong to a political uh, party, that uh, the microbes uh, aren't subject to political campaign. Mm. They're subject and affected by forceful and immediate action. And that's what I believe he would, re he would provide uh, as uh, president. Okay, thank you so much, Larry, for being with us once again today. That's former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Bloomberg contributor Larry Summers joining us today on today's Wall Street Week update. And we turn now to Courtney Donahoe for Bloomberg First Word News. Hey there, David. The coronavirus outbreak in the U.S. is going to get worse, and that's from Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He told a House committee today that how much worse it will get depends on two things, the ability of U.S. authorities to curtail the influx of travelers who may be bringing the disease into the country, and the ability of states and communities to contain local outbreaks in this country. There are more than 1,000 cases in the U.S. 31 people have died. Italy has unveiled a $28 billion stimulus package to help the country combat the coronavirus outbreak. Italy needs special permission from the European Union to spend more than allowed under the bloc's strict budget rules for its member states. The country has more than 10,000 confirmed cases of the virus and more than 600 people have died. Presidential candidate Joe Biden has widened his lead against rival Bernie Sanders. The former vice president won Michigan, the biggest prize of Tuesday's Democratic primaries. He also won in Missouri, Mississippi, and Idaho. Sanders won North Dakota. Biden and Sanders will face off in a debate on Sunday, but without a live audience because of coronavirus fears. Next week, the focus turns to Illinois, Ohio, Florida, and Arizona. And in New York, Harvey Weinstein was just sentenced to 23 years in prison for rape and sexual assault. The movie mogul was convicted last month. Weinstein also faces separate charges in Los Angeles. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Courtney Dunhoe. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Courtney. Coming up, as Courtney just said, Joe Biden cements his grip on the Democratic nomination, cruising to victory in four major states last night. Our political panel of former campaign managers Rick Davis and Jim Messina will weigh in next. This is Bloomberg. There's a place in our campaign for each of you. And I want to thank Bernie Sanders and his supporters for their tireless energy and their passion. We share a common goal, and together, we'll defeat Donald Trump. We'll defeat him together. That was Joe Biden speaking at his Philadelphia campaign headquarters just last night. That conciliatory tone came after the former vice president really took an all but insurmountable delicate lead over Senator Bernie Sanders, with wins in Mississippi, Missouri, Idaho, and most crucially in Michigan, where Senate, Senator Sanders upset Hillary Clinton all the way back in 2016. For more analysis, we welcome now our panel of former cam presidential campaign managers in Washington, Bloomberg contributor Rick Davis, where he ran for Senator John McCain's presidential campaign. And here in New York with me is Jim Messina, who ran President Obama's 2012 successful re-election campaign. So thanks to both of you. So, Rick, I want to start with you as my colleague through so much of this now. Uh, yeah. This was pretty big for Joe Biden. Is there any possibility Bernie Sanders come back? I know you never say never, but... You never say never, and, you know, it's really all up to uh, Joe Biden and how he conducts his campaign as to whether he uh, creates any opening for Bernie. So uh, that's where you want to be, uh, dependent upon your own moves to lock it up. I mean, he's consolidating the Democratic Party. When you look ahead to this week's, next week's uh, primaries, he's significantly ahead in almost every single state there. Uh, it's pretty clear that the rank and file are moving behind Biden. His overwhelming advantage amongst African-American voters and suburban voters is just going to dwarf him. Uh, Bernie continues to hold on to the youth vote uh, in a pretty significant way and will have a chip to play. Uh, when it comes time to negotiate terms. But um, this, this primary is pretty much done. And I think the sooner they turn and start looking at uh, what the campaign against 
Donald Trump's going to look like, the better off it'll be for the Democratic Party. So, Jim Messina, I've noticed that campaign managers like you and Rick always think it's all about the campaign manager, how you run the campaign. <laughs> but also, the playing field tilted here in the last four weeks or so in, in all sorts of ways, one of one which is coronavirus. Because you look at the exit polls out of Michigan, for example, yesterday, people said, I might not even agree with Joe Biden on some policy issues, but I think he can handle a crisis better than Bernie Sanders can. And right now, it looks like we may be facing a crisis. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Biden's whole pitch has always been, I'm ready to lead today, and I have the values with Barack Obama that you know I've shown over eight years. And if you look at the, the most important statistic on how people voted last night was, who do you think can beat Donald Trump? 70% of voters said that was the number one issue. Number two was leadership. On both those things, Biden dwarfs uh, Bernie, and it's why he has such an insurmountable lead. You know, I agree with Rick that this thing's all but over. But Bernie's last chance, David, is Sunday in this debate. He has got to take it to, to Biden, and he's going to hope that Biden has a very bad moment in this debate that he can exploit. I think that's unlikely. You know, Biden has gone through a bunch of these debates. He struggled early. He was amazing in South Carolina. And when you look at the, the states that are going to vote on Tuesday, all of them should probably go to Joe Biden. He has a 160-delegate lead now, and he'll walk out of there with a 300-delegate uh, lead, and it's really hard to catch him. Well, this is a really great point, it strikes me. Rick, okay, you're advising uh, uh, Joe Biden right now. How do you advise him to go into that debate and make sure that he doesn't blow it? You know, look, he's got a message that he wants to send. In fact, the last two victory nights uh, that he has had, he's actually been on message uh, during those uh, 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 victory speeches in a way that he hadn't been in a year previously. So he's definitely hitting a new message uh, seam in his campaign. It's very positive, And he needs to just stick to that. No matter what Bernie does, no matter what kind of trap is, is laid for him, he just needs to stick to his game plan, ignore the atmospherics, ignore the attacks, and just trudge on. So, Jim, I'm sure you advise the, cli the, the client or the candidate, don't pay attention to the next game, pay attention to this game. At yeah. the same time, uh, does Joe Biden have a potential problem in the Bernie Sanders supporters and whether they can bring him around? We saw the former vice president reaching out there last night. Yeah. But can he bring them into the fold to support him? I think he can, because the most important issue for Democrats is who can beat Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump is the unifying force of the Democratic Party right now, so I do think he'll consolidate people. But it's a dance he has to do, David. You know, it's a dance right now. He, I thought last night he reached out to Sanders very carefully and his voters, and he's got to continue to do that and not alienate them while he starts to focus on the general election and the general election themes that are different than the themes he's been talking about in a Democratic primary. Rick, can he do it? Can he bring some of those Bernie bros his way? Well, I think Jim is exactly right. They're not going to vote for Donald Trump. And so uh, when you look at that youth vote under 30, uh, it's pretty intensely behind uh, Sanders in the, in the Democratic primary. Uh, Sanders can turn them on to Biden. I think Biden reaching out was a very smart move. But, but let me tell you, the worst campaign to be in today is not Sanders. It's the Trump campaign. Yeah. Because they're sitting there looking at this split screen while Jim and I talk to them, and they see those numbers uh, colliding down uh, in, uh, in the stock market. And I, I unfortunately had to witness that during the 2008 campaign where I saw a perfectly good lead go down the tubes along with the stock market. And in every single political report, there was a, a Dow tracker and it had nothing but bad news. And, and so as a party in power... This is a really tough time right now. Well, let's talk about that, Jim, and this may be just uh, really shooting fish, fish in a barrel for you, but uh, in that situation, President Trump cannot stop the virus. <laughs> he's not an immunologist. At the same time, he can show leadership, and yeah. the thing you want to know is he's got a steady hand, and right now it's felt like, oh, it's not that big a deal. Oh, it really is a big deal. We're going to have a plan right away. We don't have a plan. What can he do? What can his team do, at least, to convey a sense, okay, we got this. We, we understand this. It's a problem. It's a big problem, but we're going to fix it. In moments of crisis, voters look to leaders to reassure them, right? Those are moments where they need a mom or a dad to say it's all going to be okay. Yeah. And yesterday, you saw Donald Trump do the exact opposite, right? He was in the White House. He's like, lots of good things are happening. It's all okay. And if half of what Larry Summers just said on your show happens, Rick's exactly right. The party in power gets blamed for everything. I remember when I was White House Deputy Chief of Staff, we were going through the uh, Deepwater Horizon crisis. And Obama's numbers went down drastically, and some member of Congress Congress said, it's not his fault. He has nothing to do with it. And I said, yeah, except he's the president of the United States, so everything's his fault. And what you have to do is show you have a plan and you're going to execute on the plan. And so far, you know, President Trump is an amazing counterpuncher about going back and forth with people, but he's yet to show the ability to have a second act. And that act is, here's my plan and we're going to be okay.
It's also hard to counterpunch a virus with a tweet. It I mean, that's, really that's is. A really, it's a tough problem. Yep. Okay, thanks now to our panel of Rick Davis in Washington. Always great to be with you, Rick. And Jim Messina right here with me in New York. Coming up, the latest on the market sell-off. U.S. stocks are down more than 3% at the moment. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Stocks are down about 4% now, more or less, and are at session lows. Joining us now is Kaylee Lines with a report. So I was surprised. I knew they were down, but I didn't know they were down this far. Yeah, we're seeing the losses pick up steam. As you said, we are at session lows. Interesting, it's not on as much volume as we saw yesterday. Yesterday, volume when we were buying was about 60% above average. Right now, it's about 20% above average. So that's one caveat. But I think what you're seeing is a market that hasn't been able to deliver back-to-back -back gains since back on February 12th. So yes, we were higher yesterday, but but the volatility is still rampant, and you're seeing that move to the downside today. A lot of questions about the president's fiscal stimulus, what it is exactly, when it's going to come, whether or not it will come. I think our questions you're seeing really overhanging this equity market. Yeah, and I'm told there's a, a Bloomberg headline crossing the perimeter right now. There's Stephen Mnuchin, the Secretary of Treasury, and now so we're not going to be intervening in the market. So and that's in advance of the meeting with the financial executives today. So I'm not sure what they are doing, what they aren't doing. I also am not sure what's good news or bad news. On the volume issue, I'm told, for capitulation, you want a lot of volume. So you would right. say it's not so bad because not as many people are selling at a loss, but maybe that's saying we're not there yet. Yeah, I mean, we're still 20% above average, so it's not like we're seeing lower yeah. than average volume, I will say. But yes, there's obviously a lot of volatility in this market, people looking for direction. And on your point about Mnuchin and the banks, we also saw them meeting with airlines. And Trump yesterday in his remarks said, we're going to do something to help the airlines. We're going to do something to help the cruise lines. Not a lot of detail about what exactly that entails. So among the losing stocks today, you're seeing the likes of American, United, Norwegian, down between 8 and 12 percent because they don't really seem to be believing the market is kind of saying, show me. Yeah, and in the meantime, Boeing took down their line of credit, right? They, they said, yeah. we need all that money. Thanks, we're going to take it. Yeah, according to people familiar, Boeing is going to draw down that entire $13.8 billion loan that it secured just last month. Now, it already had tapped about $7.5 billion of that just for the cash crunch they're seeing because of the grounded 737 MAX. The reason they're drawing down the rest of it is really precautionary because, again, you have an airline industry that's really in crisis. They're not going to be ordering new jets, and some, some of them are delaying advance payments on ones already on order. So that obviously creates a big problem for Boeing, and that stock is off by double digits today as well. And that's still a relatively strong company in the balance sheet. You I mean, get into right. the, the, the shale producers and things who really have a lot of leverage. So that's, it's going to be a tough time here for a lot of companies out there. Many thanks now to Kaylee Lines for that report on the markets. Coming up, Senator Tom Carper of Delaware, his thoughts on what the Senate should be doing to pump up the economy during the coronavirus uncertainty. And what is really practical? What is the time period over which the Senate and the House could act to do something once they do get a plan for President Trump, which of course they don't have as yet. We'll be having that next with Senator Tom Carper right here on Bloomberg. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Actually, we're just on television today. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Courtney Donahoe. Well, hey there, David. Iran is urging the U.S. to ease sanctions affecting imports of medicine and food as it battles a major outbreak of the coronavirus. On Tuesday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Iran first needs to release Americans who are being wrongfully detained. Iran reported 63 new virus deaths overnight, bringing the total to 354. The country has 9,000 cases of the coronavirus. It is third hardest hit country after China and Italy. A UK health minister has become the first member of the British Parliament to test positive for the coronavirus. Nadine Dorries reportedly attended a reception with Prime Minister Boris Johnson the day before she fell ill and had met hundreds of people in Parliament that week. Health officials are trying to track down people who had recent contact with Dorries. The UK has about 370 cases of the virus. And sex offender Harvey Weinstein has been sentenced to 23 years behind bars in maximum security prison. The former movie mogul was sentenced in a New York City court today. He was convicted last month of rape and criminal sex acts after decades of using his power in Hollywood to target aspiring actresses. He faces separate sex assault charges in Los Angeles. 
Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Courtney Dunhoe. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Courtney. Stocks are lower today as investors wait for President Trump's promised, very dramatic, as he called it, stimulus package, fiscal stimulus package, aimed at blunting the economic effects of the coronavirus. For more, we welcome now Democratic Senator Tom Carper from the state of Delaware. He comes to us from Capitol Hill. So, Senator, thank you for being with us. We always have to start with saying the most important thing is the health and welfare of our citizens. It's not economics, but it has a lot of economic effects. What have you heard, if anything, from the administration about what they plan to do on the fiscal stimulus front? I, I frankly, have heard uh, very, very little. Uh, the, uh, we actually have about, uh, let me, first of all, there's a lot of people in our country who are scared right now. They're scared in my state. They're scared in other states. We've lost about 30, 31, 32 people so far. There's over 1,000 people that are, that are affected, infected. So this is, uh, and we're seeing not just businesses affected, but families and the ability to gather and be a, a, a social society. So those are... Uh, those are the, in the front of my mind as well. The, the idea of, that we need fi, uh, fiscal stimulus, we, we're running a $1 trillion budget deficit. So I think we're running one of the largest budget deficits we've ever run in our life. This comes at the end of uh, 10, 11 years, the longest running economic expansion in the history of our country. And to say that somehow we need to pile on uh, more money, what we need to do is, frankly, the administration needs to do its job. We need to make sure that, uh, that uh, we have plenty of diagnostic tests that are being ordered. We want to make sure that we not only have those tests uh, available throughout the country as needed, but we have the ability to process the tests and actually find out information about who has this disease, who's carrying it, and what can we do about it. And it's, but do their job. Do their job. And the idea to say that we're going to uh, do something about payroll taxes and so forth to stimulate the economy, uh, we got a, a trillion dollars of stimulus right now uh, pumping this economy up. And uh, for folks that are, you know, jobs, people who lost their jobs, people that need help with unemployment insurance. Sure, we have the system to, to do that, and we, we need to do that, and we need to make sure that people have access to health care. This administration has helped make 10 million people lose health care in the last three years. We need people to have their health care. And for folks, uh, folks who actually do need the help, let's help them. Uh, Carrie, I'm a little bit less concerned about the stock market right now, I'm more concerned about the, 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 the folks that are in the supermarket. And make sure that, that we, this is multi-level, it's not just the federal government, it's not just the state government. We had a, a briefing yesterday, our delegation with our uh, folks, our congressional delegation with our people running public health back in Delaware. We need to be doing that and coordinating that uh, throughout the country. We have our job to do, states have their jobs to do, individuals have their jobs to do, the stuff we talk about all the time, washing hands, not coughing in public when you're six stay home and avoids large social gatherings. Those are the things we need to do. Well, to, to your point about the concern across the country, we have a headline that you may well not have seen. It just came across that Dr. Fauci from the NIH now says that uh, the coronavirus likely is 10 times more lethal than the flu, which is certainly very sobering. But I wonder if some of the things you mentioned aren't connected with one another. You said people should stay home if they're sick. Some people really rely upon that paycheck, and they don't have sick pay and things like that. Actually, it could make the disease and the spread of the disease worse if we don't give them some support to say, you know what, I can still afford to pay my rent if I stay home. Yeah, some people face a Hobson's choice. Uh, stay home, lose their paycheck. We, uh, we want to make sure that, that employers are uh, being reasonable, compassionate. We have uh, the ability, not everybody can telework to, uh, to, uh, to work. And, uh, and, and work from their homes. A lot of people can, and they're learning how to, to, to do that more, uh, more often. So uh, I always like to say I'm a golden rule guy, try to treat other people the way we want to be treated. We need to put ourselves in the shoes of people who might be ad adversely affected and figure out ways to, to help them. There's probably not uh, one size doesn't fit all, but I think the golden rule applies here. Senator, is this consuming all the legislative time and attention right now at the Capitol? I know you have a bill that you're proposing that would really deal with carbon emissions uh, and have get, really get us on a green basis in the country. Very important issue, no question about it. It's particularly timely right now given what's going on with the price of oil. But is there any time and attention span of the Congress to deal with something like that right now? Well, sure. We, uh, we can... Uh... We could do more than one thing at a time. There's mm -hmm. a, a lot of a a time and attention. But it's not this, again, the coronavirus is not just all in the federal government. This is a partnership with individual peoples, families, businesses, with uh, state uh, and local governments as well. Uh, I, I want to come back to the point you raised. I just come from a hearing in the Environment and Public Works Committee. Part of our hearing fo focused on the nominee to hold the second highest position at, uh, at EPA. And uh, among the points that, uh, that, uh, that we explored was we, are, we live on a planet that's uh, getting hotter. Here it is. It's, it's still one winter, and we're seeing 70-degree uh, uh, weather. We're seeing here in Washington, D.C., we're seeing uh, uh, the cherry blossoms who normally come out in April. They're, they're here now. Uh, last five years are the five hottest years on record. 
January was the hottest January on record. My wife uh, recently came back from a trip to Antarctica and uh, came back in uh, literally days after she returned from, from that trip. Uh, Antarctica's temperature was rec recorded 63, all-time record, South Pole. Next week, two weeks later, 65. Two weeks later, 67. Uh, we, uh, we're, uh, uh, we've seen uh, Australia earlier this year. A, a part of Australia the size of my native state of West Virginia literally burned up. A billion animals killed. And uh, so th there's a, that is a, a, huge, a huge challenge that we face as well. As it turns out, there are things that we can do to address climate crisis and create jobs at the same time. We can do it through the automotive industry. We can do it with our, the power plants that create our electricity. We can actually do it by, by changing the kind of coolers and refrigerants that we use in our, our refrigerators on our air conditioners and phase out something that's a thousand times worse than, the, uh, than carbon dioxide and replace it with something that actually creates jobs and is good for our health and good for our safety as a planet. Okay, Senator, it's always a treat to have you on. Thank you so much for your time today. That's Democratic Senator Tom Carper from the state of Delaware. Coming up here, former HHS secretary and current Florida Congresswoman Donna Shalala will be joining us. Her thoughts on the best way to respond to the coronavirus. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. The White House is set to hold an emergency meeting on its coronavirus response later today. This comes as House Democrats are set to vote tomorrow on an economic plan to help workers affected by the outbreak. We welcome now Democratic Representative Donna Shalala from Florida. She's also former Secretary of the Health and Human Services Department. She comes to us from Capitol Hill. So, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. You really have almost a unique perspective having run HHS and now you are in Congress. What do we need as a country? What do we need from the administration and Congress right now to address this crisis? Well, we've already passed an $8 billion plus uh, bill to help fund um, the agencies that are working on coronavirus. Now we need to do an economic package, which must focus on families. Um, you were just talking to Senator Tom Carper uh, about uh, the need for sick leave, but we also need to enhance unemployment insurance. Uh, we need to take a look at some of our benefit packages like the SNAP benefits, the old food stamp uh, programs to make sure that people have enough to eat if they have to lose their jobs um, or be out of their jobs for a period of time. It's actually illegal for someone to fire someone uh, because they're ill. And, but there are a lot of people that are part of the gig economy, and so there must be a series of supports, and that includes free testing um, and uh, free health care for those who don't have insurance. Uh, we need to take care of everyone uh, who might get sick. This is a deadly disease, particularly for seniors and for those who have a uh, compromised immune system. So um, we can step up. We're Americans. We know how to do this. Um, and if it's money, we'll spend the money and protect people. I know that the administration wants to talk about protecting industry. Look, I'm, I represent the big industries, the big cruise line industries, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian Cruise, they're all in my district. And I care a lot about them and about the people that work for them, 150,000 jobs just in my district uh, uh, alone. Um, so uh, we have to talk to the cruise industries. We'll do that this afternoon. And of course, the airlines are hurting as well, but they've been very profitable over the last couple of years. So I'm not as worried about them, but I do think that we have to start by worrying about families, making sure that they have the financial supports that they need if they need to go through a transition. You make such a powerful point, Congressman. On the one hand, you have people who are more directly affected either because they themselves have to be quarantined or they have to stay home with children and we have to protect those people, try to provide for those people. There are also people that could lose their jobs just because their companies come under real stress, particularly small and medium-sized enterprises, because as we see what appears to be a downturn coming, you can just have layoffs not directly related to coronavirus but indirectly related. Do we need to be prepared to step in because we could start losing jobs certainly in the cruise industry, but it could go well beyond that. Yes, uh, and there's no question about that. And in the $8 billion package, we actually had an enhancement for the Small Business Administration, mm. loans to help people transition. I'm particularly uh, worried about 
things like restaurants and, and other kinds of small businesses in my community that might need some help. We did include that in the $8 billion. We may have to do more. Whatever we need to do, we ought to do. I, I want to draw upon your expertise as the, as the head of HHS back under President Obama, or President Clinton, sorry. Uh, how far behind this virus are we? There's a perception that we got off to a sort of a slow start with it. Is that fair, and are we catching up? There's no question that uh, we stumbled out of the blocks. We always have, because we don't have a readiness system in public health. We've been defunding public health. It's not only what the president did, um, in, in terms of the White House, defunding the global health programs and some of the expertise, uh, trying to cut the CDC. But more than that, over the years, we have not understood that we need to fund state and local health departments at a very high level because they're our first line of defense, as well as deep investments in the FDA and the NIH, uh, in the CDC. And We've been cutting these or not increasing these programs over a long period of time. Now we have to understand that there's another virus coming, maybe a year or two from now. I don't know its name, but we better be ready. The way we are for hurricanes in my community, where we have the staff in place, we have the systems in place, we have the resources uh, in place, and if we need additional resources, we can automatically get them because of the Stafford Act from, the, uh, from FEMA. So uh, we just need a different level of readiness. That's our fault, every single administration, and we need to do it now because we can't keep ad hocing this. We're ad hocing it. Yes, the administration was slow. Yes, the president of the United States is stepping right. over the messages. Uh, but right now, we're trying to play catch up. And I think uh, we're doing a pretty good job, particularly on testing. By next week, we ought to have all the test kits we need to be able to test the people that need to be tested. So, 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 Congressman, finally, um, there was a perception at the beginning that President Trump really didn't want this to be a big deal, and he sort of played it down. In talking to President Trump, talking to Vice President Pence, talking to people in the White House, do they get it now? Do they really think that this is a really big problem we have to address? They do get it. I don't know whether the president gets it. Every time he opens his mouth, I get... He frightens me, uh, and I know better. Um, I, I don't know if there's a way to get more discipline in this president. It's just not a word that applies to him. But he is dangerous to our health every time he opens his mouth. Uh, everybody else around him is trying to do the right thing. Uh, but the president is just, I just can't believe it. I've never known a president like this. I've known presidents that tripped a little bit and then corrected themselves, but I've never known a president that kept doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Congressman. It's always great to have you with us. That's Democratic Representative Donna Shalala from the state of Florida. Coming up here, the latest on the sell-off. Markets are slightly off their lows now, down between 3.5% and 4% in the equities. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. It's time to check in on the markets once again. We've been looking at them all hour long. Joining us now is Kaylee Lines, And they're coming off their very lowest sex, but they're still down 3 half, 4%. Yeah, like I mean, that. they're still hovering right around the lows. You are seeing really just an equity market that is very much doubting the prospects for fiscal stimulus coming from the Trump administration. It's been promised. Trump didn't show up last night. We still have a lot of questions, not a lot of answers. And so you're seeing equity investors kind of uh, really coming out of risk, more so going into safe havens, although the Treasury yield is down two basis points. That is uh, less of a move than we were seeing earlier in the session, but you are still seeing that money going into the bond market and it's very clearly coming out of equities. And right the now. yield curve steepened a little bit. Last time I checked, it was like 28 basis points or something like that. It didn't flatten out completely, which might be reassuring to some. Right. And, and gold <laughs> continues to go up. Yeah, gold was actually off its uh, highs the last time I checked. So you're seeing still some bit of a safe haven uh, bid, but not the moves, of the scale of which we've been seeing for the past couple of weeks or so. On the point of the yield curve, though, in the Fed, we know we got the emergency rate cut last week. The market is expecting a lot more. One area where it is showing up is in home refinancing. That surge, <laughs> applications for it, surged 80% yeah. last week. Okay. So really skyrocketing. What's interesting is that is taking home builders a lot lower today because if people are refinancing existing mortgages, maybe they're not 
going out and buying new homes. So you're seeing the likes of Lunar off by about 9% today, and they're really taking it out of the chin, which is interesting. Guilty as charged. I mean, because my <laughs> bank called up and said it has a two in front of it, not a three. So, I mean, boy, get your attention. No question. And many thanks to Katie Lines for that report on the markets. The coronavirus has hit not just China and not just Italy very hard. It's also hit Iran particularly hard. To get us read on the spread of the disease there, we turn now to Robert D. Kaplan. He's managing director at the Eurasia Group, coming to us today from Washington. So, Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. What is going on in Iran? And maybe more pointedly, do we know? Um, thank, thank you for having me. We've had over 300 deaths, 9,000 cases declared in Iran. It's probably a lot higher uh, than that. This is the icing on the cake of 40 years of mismanagement. Uh, you know, when you think about it, 30, 40 years ago at the time of the Islamic Revolution, Iran had a higher economic development and quality of life than, than South Korea even. Now it is way, way below South Korea, way, way below Turkey, despite all the oil and natural gas. The regime has no real competence. It's both authoritarian and it's ideologically motivated at all levels so that the level of competence is not as high as it should be given the high level of, you know, of education in Iran. Um, so when you consider a lowering oil price, Iran's a, a, an energy producer, um, being ravaged by the coronavirus. We just had parliamentary elections in Iran where the turnout in Tehran was only 25 percent and 43 percent nationally. We're seeing a total collapse of confidence in the Iranian regime from the Iranian people. Well, that's a pretty long list, Robert, but let me be very, very specific. When we talk about what the problem is with the coronavirus, is it the quality of the healthcare system? Do they have a public health system that can deal with it? Is it a matter of misdiagnosing the problem and not acting on it fast enough, or do they just not have the infrastructure to really deal with it? They have quite a decent public health system. The problem has been is that the regime was first in denial mode. We talk about President Trump initially being in denial mode, but it was nothing compared to the Iranian uh, government, where the president, uh, uh, Rouhani, said that it was an enemy plot. So when you had that level of denial at the critical point when the, when the virus was starting to spread, they lost a lot of time. So this is really a political issue. They do have the health care system that could at least deal with it better than most Middle Eastern countries. Are there consequences for the regime? Because there were demonstrations, deaths actually, leading up to those uh, elections. At the same time, the elections, perhaps only 25 percent of the people in Tehran voted, but they apparently went uh, sort of to the right, more conservatively backing the Ayatollah, as it, as it were. Are there consequences for the regime at some point to people yeah. say, you know what, we don't um, think you're doing a good enough job? Uh, they backed the, the right wing won the elections because most of the other candidates were disqualified. Mm. It was as close as you could get to a fixed election, as, um, as you can imagine. The, the consequences are, look, you're not going to have massive demonstrations now, David, because the, uh, the population is scared to gather in large numbers because of the virus. Uh, you know, the streets are, are much less crowded than they used to be. But there will come a point after the virus subsides in six months, nine months, nobody knows, uh, where, there's gonna, where there may be a price to pay. And Iran has a tradition of massive demonstrations. The regime has in its corner the Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, the Basiji uh, militias. To, um, and the Iranian regime has shown as recently as last fall that it is willing to kill a significant number of people to stay in power uh, because of religion and ideology. Fascinating. Do we have a sense of what they're doing now with respect to the coronavirus? That is, say, is there quarantining going on? Are they segmenting parts of the population? Are they shutting off cities and things the way, for example, we saw in China? Well, first of all, they've canceled a lot of Friday prayers, which, was the, which is the big weekly event where people gather in large numbers. They have been trying, they have been starting to quarantine. The problem is that they lost precious time in a state of denial far, far worse than President Trump. Are they asking for outside help? Uh, I, uh, I'm not... I'm not sure of that right now. Um, they're certainly not, um, you know, they're not getting help from the West, from Europe and the U.S. at this point. But this is a very evolving situation. 
If they were to turn to somebody for help, would it be Russia? Where would they turn? Um, they would probably turn to China. They could turn to China, to Russia. Uh, you, know, you know, the reports are mixed, but China has been able to take severe action against the virus because of the nature of the authoritarian regime in China. It was able to do things that a democratic system simply cannot do. Right. Um, but, but, they, but turning to China is a natural, is a natural move. Turning to Russia, right. you, know, you know, countries that have a higher level of expertise in, in the management of this. But you point out an irony there, that if the dictatorship does the right thing, it's actually more effective sometimes. If it does the wrong thing, it's really a problem. Exactly, exactly. A dictatorship can quarantine whole cities. It could arrest people who don't go for testing. It could do all kinds of things. Um, so it gives it an advantage, but the downside is if this, you know, the, you know, the coronavirus is nature unleashed. Ma you know, man is, and women are biological species existing in right. nature. And so ultimately the right. regime doesn't control the spread of it. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Okay, many thanks now to Robert D. Kaplan of the Eurasia Group. We're going to have more with him coming up in the 12 o'clock East, at 12 o'clock Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, including we'll be discussing the effect of plunging prices on oil for Iran. On. And ahead on Bloomberg Television, much more on the market sell-off and the close of trading in Europe. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg.